I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the other side of hacking, which you don't normally get to hear about. What it, what's it like to be a black hat? Because that's what I was when I, when, when I was a teenager, when I was 15 or 16 years old. But first of all, a little bit of background about me. How did I get into cybersecurity or hacking in the first place? Like many young people um, who, are, who are in my position, I first got, got my first computer when I was very young, when I was about seven or eight years old. And it was very like, this, is, this, is, this wasn't the actual computer, but this was, it was just a very like old Windows 98 Dell Optitex, Optitex machine. And how many of you re recognize this piece of software? This, this is called Microsoft Front Page. It's a, it's a very old piece of software that used to come by default with Microsoft Office in the 90s and, and, early, 20, uh, and early 2000s. And it basically lets you create your own website through this kind of basic, what you see is what you get editor. And that's kind of first how I got into um, coding and programming. I, just, I would create these, I, would, I first learned HTML by creating these simple websites that I would then upload to GeoCities back when that was a, back th when that was a thing. Um, and through that, I kind of learned more advanced programming languages like PHP and Python, etc. And when I was learning how to program, when I was about 10 or 11, I was just kind of searching on Google um, for online tutorials how to program. Because it's very easy to kind of teach, teach yourself how to program nowadays. And my first kind of experience of hacking is when you program, you kind of realize the ways that programmers could make mistakes when they write code and how those mistakes could actually allow a hacker to get access to your system or do something that you didn't think was possible with your code. So when I was about maybe 12 or 13, one day I was doing my maths homework and I didn't have an online calculator. I didn't have a calculator with me. So I just searched on, online on Google for an online calculator. And one of the first ones I found was this web page on the University of Maryland website created by this mathematics professor that was supposed to be an online calculator where you can just type in um, basic sums and it would give you the results. And I kind of realized that if this, if this math mathematics professor programmed the calculator the way I think he did, then it would be vulnerable to a sim very simple um, vulnerability called remote code execution. Because the way that he programmed this calculator would, was that it was just an input box where it, where it takes in any code you like and would execute that code. But he didn't realize that you could just type in code into the calculator. He thought you could only type in sums. So basically, that would, that would allow me to hack, hack a website through a vulnerable calculator, which I thought was kind of funny at the time. So I kind of emailed this professor to tell him of, of the vulnerability. And he tried to fix it. He, not, he wasn't completely successful. But um, that's kind of when I really got an interest in cybersecurity. Um, I kind of. Um, got, got into pro hacking in a kind of political and activist way. So I was kind of a really big fan of the, of the Pirate Bay, which was this, you know, this, this website where you can um, illegally download software, movies, etc., that are copyrighted. And to me, th the Pirate Bay was really interesting because they were doing something that was blatantly illegal, but they, weren't, they, they were kind of proud about it. They were kind of saying that we are we believe in freedom of information, and we believe that the co copyright laws and the copyright lobby nowadays um, are kind of restrict restricting that freedom on the internet because the internet was kind of seen as this tool that democratizes the flow of information and gives people who might not otherwise afford it the ability to, edu to educate themselves and otherwise better themselves through software and information. So the Pirate Bay would get a lot of these kind of um, legal takedown requests from all these all, lots of different companies. And I kind of found the way that they responded to these requests you know, absolutely hilarious. They were kind of really s snarky and sarcastic. So for example, one time they received this, um, this, 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 this takedown notice from, from, this, from some company called Web Sheriff, which kind of sounds, sounds really scary. And the way that the Pirate Bay responded was, to, was by sending them an invoice um, for the pants and floor cleaning due to wetting themselves because of their scary threats. And I kind of really like that kind of sense of humor, that kind of snarky sense of humor, and also kind of like using information um, and data to kind of you know, expose, uh, expose things. And so I kind of like adapted this um, when I was a teenager. So when I was about, um, when I was doing my A-levels actually, 
my, uh, I, felt that my, I felt that my biology teacher was just taking way too much homework. I, I, just, I think I, I thought her homework was completely useless. So she had this online Google Doc where you could just see, um, you can see everyone's name and how much homework they did next to their name. And there was also this on, other published Google Doc where you could see everyone's name and their test result in the mock. So I plotted the correlation between how much homework people did and their test result. And it turned out to be a negative correlation. So like the more homework you did, the lower your test result. So I kind of showed this to everyone in the class and everyone suddenly stopped doing their homework. <laughs> and this kind of like way of thinking, this kind of, is very kind of reminiscent of, of, of how hackers think. And this is, this, is, this is basically kind of what hacktivism is all about, using information and data to expose truths about the world. And my kind of first um, experience of hacktivism for those of you that don't know, hacktivism is a kind of mash of the word hacking and activism, where you hack for political purposes, is when um, there was this Indian software company that threatened to launch denial of service attacks against um, piracy websites that refused to take down content. And this was kind of interesting, this was kind of really interesting at the time, because Anonymous, which was this kind of, which I'm sure all of you have heard of Anonymous, this kind of decentralized ha hacking or, um, collective, kind of saw this and thought, well, we should give you a taste of your own medicine because you're kind of threatening the freedom of information on the internet. So they responded to this company who was suspected of being recruited to do this by the Motion Picture Association of America and the Recording Industry Association of America with a denial of service attack um, to take them down, to kind of, um, give them a taste of their own medicine. Because if they were launching denial of service attacks against the Pirate Bay, then they are, it's also fair game to kind of respond to them with a denial of service attack. So, um, and this was kind of like really like revolutionary at the time to, to protest through denial of service attacks. Now this, this is obviously nowadays, it's kind of old and boring, but at, at the time it was, it was kind of like a really interesting way to protest. Eventually the campaign moved on to other targets such as, such as this British company called ACS Law, which is this company, this kind of like copyright law firm, which is recruited by a bunch of pornography companies to basically troll um, torrent websites and get the IP addresses of people who are illegally co copywriting, illegally pirating porn movies, which they would then subpoena the ISPs and send those people um, scary threats or, black, or letters blackmailing them to pay up or take them to court. Now, there was a massive flaw in their kind of strategy because in the UK, most ISPs um, have what's called dynamic IP addresses. So your IP address is always changing every time you're connected to the internet. So in most cases, these people were sending threats to completely innocent people that had nothing to do with do downloading pornography, like really old pensioners and, and married men. Anonymous decided to res respond to that with the denial of service attack, but what happened, what happened in this case was kind of interesting because when they were trying to move, migrate their website and systems to another host to, to deal with the attack, the administrator of the website made a massive mistake and accidentally published a whole backup of their systems um, on, online on their front page. So we downloaded this, this backup and we published it to the Pirate Bay and it turned out this backup contained all of the company's emails and all of the sort of people that they were blackmailing. And as a result of that, they were kind of, they were fined over this data breach and it was revealed that um, this kind of law firm was up to a lot of shady activities. And because of that, they were suspended from law for two years. Or the head lawyer was suspended from law for two years. And this was, you know, I was, just, I was about 15 years old at the time so I, this is when I kind of realized that actually you know, using some, some basic techniques, you can, you can pretty much um, kind of expose, expose, wrongdoing about, expose wrongdoing or corruption and kind of make a positive impact on society through hacktivism. So I started this hacking group called Internet Feds, and here you can see the FBI indictment of this hacking group. And the idea was to kind of, well, try to use hacktivism as a means for good to influence changes in society and expose wrongdoing or corruption. 
So one of the first things we did was kind of like a more humorous thing. We, upload, we found a vulnerability in the Copyright Alliance, which was like a copyright lobbying group, and uploaded and turned their website into a piracy website. Um, we also participated in the Tunisian Arab Spring, where we um, de defaced the website of the Prime Minister of Tunisia with a kind of like pro-revolutionary message. And more seriously, we also discovered that the Tunisian government was injecting malicious JavaScript code into login pages of Facebook and Gmail, etc., to try and get everyone's usernames and passwords to kind of figure out who the people that are protesting are so that they can kind of tor torture them, really. And as a response to that, we developed this um, browser script that would protect you against the malicious JavaScript code that the government was injecting onto these websites. And this was downloaded a couple of thousand times. And the Tunisians actually thanked us for this. So this was kind of, um, it was kind of like evidence to me that the internet can have a real change on people's lives. Some companies wanted to really capitalize on the attention that Anonymous was, was getting. So there was this company called HB Gary Federal that um, published this piece in the Financial Times claiming that they had uncovered the leaders of Anonymous, which really made no sense at the time because the whole point of Anonymous was that there was no leaders. It was just a decentralized group. And they, kind of, they just claimed that they had figured out who the key figures are and the addresses and the locations, etc. cetera. And they, um, they thought that the worst would happen was that they would simply get, a, they, they would get taken down by Anonymous through a denial of service attack. But it turned out that a, lo a lot worse to them happened uh, because their, their website was vulnerable to SQL injection, which is kind of really surprising for a security company to be vulnerable to SQL injection on their website. And also the CEO used the same password everywhere. He used, he used the same password for his World of Warcraft accounts as his email accounts. And because of that, it, all of the emails were leaked. Which exposed, which exposed some shady things that they were doing, such as um, they were working with Palantir to kind of, on behalf of Bank of America, to tackle WikiLeaks. And one of the things they were plotting was trying to blackmail American journalists who were, support, who were in support of WikiLeaks or trying to fuel the feud between activists and, and these various groups to kind of try to break them apart. And as a result of this, Palantir cut ties with H.P. Gary because they were kind of embarrassed that this stuff was being revealed. And Congress actually opened an investigation into this company because of what they were up to. And this actually kind of really went mainstream. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a video. I hope you like techno okay. thrillers because I'm about to tell you a ripping yarn about WikiLeaks and their founder, albino matchstick Julian Assange. <laughs> You may not know that WikiLeaks is protected by a global hacker nerd brigade known as Anonymous, whose commitment to openness and free exchange of information is right there in the name. <laughs> Anonymous attacks whoever attacks WikiLeaks. Now, WikiLeaks claims they have incriminating files from a major U.S. bank proving corporate malfeasance. Some speculate that's Bank of America, mostly because Bank of America says, that sounds like us. <laughs> Now, B of A was worried. Luckily, the Obama Justice Department said, hey, we know a guy who knows a guy who can make your WikiLeaks problem go away. <laughs> the government introduced them to the law firm Hunton and Williams, who introduced B of A to the CEO of the security firm H.B. Gary, Aaron Barr. Barr, a self-described master of counter-hacking, which evidently meant that he had an email account. <laughs> Because Barr said he could take down WikiLeaks with cyber attacks against their infrastructure and faking documents to make WikiLeaks look unreliable. But first, he had to take out WikiLeaks guard dog, Anonymous. <laughs> down boy. <laughs> Barr threatened Anonymous by telling the Financial Times he had collected information on their core leaders, including many of their real names. Now, to put that in hacker terms, Anonymous is a hornet's nest. And Barr said, I'm going to stick my penis in that thing. <laughs> because...
faster than you can say, get these hornets off my penis. Anonymous took down Barr's website, stole his emails, deleted the company's backup data, trashed his Twitter account, and remotely wiped his iPad. And he had just reached the Hammam High level on Angry Birds. Anonymous. Anonymous then published all of Barr's emails, including one from his wife saying, I will file for divorce and Barr's World of Warcraft name, Severance Finn. That's right. They ruined both his lives. Now, on the plus side, ladies, Severinston is now single. And he's a level 80 night elf druid with a hateful gladiator's worm hide helm. So we know he wears protection on his worm. Now, the emails. Barr's emails also reveal that Barr was planning to gather damaging personal information and use it to blackmail WikiLeaks supporting journalists like Salon's Glenn Greenwald. Now, all of this leads to a disturbing conclusion. The Obama administration's Justice Department advised the largest bank in America where to find a corporate hacker to fabricate information that could be used to blackmail American journalists. And they totally blew it. <laughs> that proves the government can't do anything right. Okay, so, so I think this kind of really, to me, is an extreme example of the, the PR disasters that hacking could could really have. Um, I do feel sorry for the, I, I do feel sorry for the guy. Um, I, the impact never really was supposed to be on on Aaron Bar. It was kind of supposed to be on the company, but this was six years ago. And now we now Aaron and I have talked sometimes, and it's all good. So he came. To, he even came to London once, and we met with him. So it's, it's, so all's good now. Um, but speaking of people who are trying to really get attention on this, trying to, get, trying to jump on the bandwagon and get attention from anonymous, was the Westboro Baptist Church. And the Westboro, Westboro Baptist, Baptist Church is this really controversial um, family in America that does things like go to the funerals of dead soldiers and put up massive signs like you're going to hell because, um, you know, God is America's, America's doom, and, for, and God hates fags, and things like that. So they put up this press release um, telling, to, telling Anonymous, saying, this is an open letter from the West Baptist Church, servants of God, to Anonymous's coward crybaby hackers, to, and to basically bring you on, because um, nothing can shut up the word of God, etc. And this was obviously like a massive kind of, this, these people thrive on attention. So we kind of gave them this attention. Um, I, was, I would play the video, but there's not enough time. But what happened was that they actually, we actually uh, went on a live radio show with them, with, with Jake and Michelle Lee, a spokesman from the Rust Church. And they were actually hacked on a live radio show. So, which is really entertaining. You can watch it online if you search for West Baptist Church hacked. Had, the video has something like five million views. But it was definitely one of, one of the most thrilling things to do. About three months after that, um, we, I co-founded this hacking group called Lulzec, which was an offshoot of Anonymous f based on about five people that I tr kind of trusted within the group. Now, the point of Lulzec was to kind of do hacking outside of the rules of Anonymous, because under Anonymous, Anonymous is a very political thing. It's, everything you do, it kind of has a, has a purpose. And so LulzSec was kind of supposed to be the sandbox where we kind of do, other, do things for non-political purposes. Because for example, one of the rules of, of Anonymous is that you don't attack the press. But the point of LulzSec was that we discovered so many vulnerabilities in large organizations and corporations like Fox that we didn't really have a kind of reason to hack. So, but every time we reported these vulnerabilities, they would never really do something about it and they wouldn't really care about it. We would just report the vulnerability and they would ignore you because they kind of don't really see the risks or they don't have a proper security team or they, they, they just can't be bothered fixing it. So the point of LawSec was to kind of make it a PR disaster 
for these companies so that their customers could know who they're really trusting their data with. And the motto was basically laughing at your security since 2011. But our, our first target was Fox, where we leaked the X-Factors database. And throughout the 50 days that LawFlake existed, there were a lot of targets, including Sony, Fox, um, the Senate, FBI affiliated InfraGuard, and also the Arizona Department of Public Safety. Sony is a really classic example of how not to, how not to do security. Because Sony was hacked 21 times in one year, 21 times publicly in 2011. And about 20 of the, most of them were in one month, in, in a two month period, in June and July. And Sony was kind of like the game of the year among hackers. It was kind of like, let's see who can hack Sony the most. <laughs> yeah. uh, they also like hacked Sony about seven times. And I think the reason why they were so vulnerable was, first of all, they did, they did have a security team. I think they did have a pretty large security team, but they had just laid off their entire security team before all of these hacks happened. The, the big PlayStation Network hack, if, if you remember, in 2011, the one where 80 million users were compromised, that was actually, not many people know this, but that was actually um, an insider, insider job. Because a week before that hack, someone actually contacted me on IRC, which is a, like an online chat room protocol, um, claiming to be from Sony, saying that they're kind of disgruntled or annoyed at Sony and they wanted to do something to teach, teach them a lesson. And I didn't really believe, obviously I didn't believe they were from Sony initially, but to prove that they were from Sony, they actually connected to the chat room from an IP address that corresponded to um, Sony's PlayStation Network database. So this was actually someone who was connecting from the PlayStation Network database a week before the hack, saying that we want to do, some, we want to do something to piss off Sony because they laid off the entire security team. And a week later, we, we, there's, we, there's massive headlines in the news that, that there was this hack. And Sony had hundreds and hundreds of different servers and websites um, for all different parts of the business, whether it be Sony Music, um, Sony Pictures, etc., and also like, lots of little websites for all of the kind of movies and albums. And pretty much every single one of those websites were vulnerable to something really basic, like SQL injection. That's, that's how, they, how, that's how they, were they were hacked most of the time. Um, the Arizona Department of Public Safety, which is Arizona's police department, they were hacked because they had a webmail interface where most of the police officers used passwords like 123456. And these were police officers. Like they were holding really sensitive information that is life or death, and these are the people that are supposed to be keeping us safe. But again, it's, it's these really low-hanging fruits that always bite organizations in the back. It seems to me that, from what I've learned on, from this, is that the larger your organization, the more likely it is, or the more vulnerable it is to being hacked, because the more servers you have, the more systems you have, and the more employees you have, the larger the, the attack factor. And the thing that really kind of proves this to me is that the Westboro, the Westboro Baptist Church was actually harder to hack than Sony. Sony was hacked through simple SQL injections, but for the West Baptist Church, I actually had to spend multiple days looking through source code of software that they used to find zero-day exploits that no one had discovered before just to hack this you know, tiny church. So, so it really seems to me that the larger the organization, the larger the attack vector. It was, some of the stuff we did was, was, was a bit overhyped, so, for example, we, did a, we launched a denial of service attack against the CIA, web, the CIA website, and they were taken down. And the, the media reported this as the CIA website hacked. Um, this kind of really highlights to me the kind of hype and fear and misreporting that the um, media rep reports on cybersecurity and hacks. There's a lot of misinformation and, and unuseful information that kind of doesn't really help anyone when, if they want to actually learn properly about the risks of cybersecurity and how these things work. And SKCD even did a response to this to say that this was, this, the CIA wasn't actually hacked, it was just that someone took down a poster hanged by the CIA, which is kind of a, what a the last service attack basically is. But um, it really kind of, this, this last attack really kind of blew up in the media. At one point we had, we were trending more than one direction on Google Trends. <laughs> 
and we had we had 300,000 followers in two months, and I think um, the journalist Patrick Gray really made a good point about why this was. Uh, he wrote an article called "Why We Secretly Love Dolsek," because people really seem to kind of in information security really love to watch or follow uh, what Lossack was doing on Twitter, just kind of like the same way that they would follow a hashtag of the release of a new movie. For some reason, people wanted to watch the um, watch organized crime on Twitter. But he basically hypothesized that the weak security and all low-hanging fruits in all these organizations was kind of the, the big elephant in the room that cybersecurity professionals have been warning organizations about for, for years. All of these really simple simple SQL injections or simple vulnerabilities or unpatched systems or basic passwords that organizations are being um, let down by. Cybersecurity professionals have been warning companies about this for years, but they could never really drive that, that, drive that point home without actually, um, doing it, without actually doing it legally and hacking those companies. And that's basically what LawSec did. LawSec kind of vindicated the entire information security community by actually doing those hacks and letting people know about how weak all of these organization security are. Um, this is some New York security um, community actually dressed up as LulzSec for Halloween. <laughs> and people actually, some people actually prevent, pretended to be hacked by LulzSec just to jump on the, on the attention bandwagon. Um, but I think the reason why this kind of got really popular and why people were entertained by this is not just because of the hacking aspects or what we hacked. It was also because of the kind of humor aspects and the, and the cultural aspects. Everything we did was done with, with, some, with, with a little bit of humor. So for example, when we um, hacked the PBS, we published a, a fake article saying that TPAC was still alive in New Zealand. And um, after the news of the world hacking scandal in 2011, where some newspapers were accused of hacking phones of celebrities, we hacked into the Sun newspaper, which was one of the organizations accused of doing this, to put, a, put up a fake news article that Rupert Murdoch was found dead in his, in his temporary garden. And people were, people were kind of really just entertained by this. Um, there was actually a play about Lulzsec that was shown in the Royal Court Theater in 2015 for two months. And you can see here, these are, these are all of the main characters of Lulzsec in all of these chat rooms that, were actually, that are actually now portrayed in a play in the Royal Court Theater. Um, and now the play was, was, is now showing in the South Korean theater. Um, so what happened after that? This was all in 2011, and just after I had finished my GCSEs when I was 16, um, I was arrested by the Metropolitan Police, by the EPCEU, which is the Electronic Police Central Crimes Unit. This was back before the National Crime Agency existed. And I was taken to a police station to be interviewed, and they were supposed to arrest me 82 times, one for each offense. So they, had to caution, they were supposed to caution me 80 times, which is when you say, um, you don't have to say anything, but if you don't say anything, it may harm your defense, etc. So they were supposed to say this 80, 80 times, but they only said 40 times because they got bored halfway through because it was just taking really long to arrest me 80 times for each, for each different hack. And I was advised by my lawyer to give a no comment interview. So, so I basically res responded no comment to every question they asked. And that was good advice in hindsight because the other people in the group didn't follow the advice. So they were charged sooner and with more um, offenses. So there were, out of the six people in LASIC, four of them were in the UK, and four of them, yeah, four of them were in, four of them in the UK, and they were all arrested in the UK. Um, I received a, a community service sentence, 320 hours of community service in a charity shop, selling clothes for deaf blind people, which is kind of a, which isn't bad, I think, for hacking the, for, for hacking all of these organisations. Um, I, I think the reason why they were so lenient was because I was under 18. I was a minor at, at the time, so they tr sentenced me as a minor. But my other co-defendants who were over 18 had spent a, lot, spent a bit of time in jail, but not 
any more than six months each. So which is quite lenient compared to the US, where one of our co-defendants, Jeremy Hammond, got 10 years in jail, which is more than rapists and murderers in the US get. One of the people in the group was a 30-year-old uh, man living in New York called Hector Monsegur, who was arrested by the FBI and turned into an informant for two years. So he was just sitting on all these chat rooms recording logs and kind of um, encouraging people to hack various things so, so that the FBI would arrest him, which is kind of really controversial because this guy was telling people to hack all of these government servers with the FBI watching him. Um, and after that, you can see the FBI indictment where they claimed that we had affected over a million victims, which is kind of, I think, of exaggeration. So after all of this, I, I still kind of enjoy the humorous aspect of it. There was this FBI agent called Chuck Esposito. He was giving a talk at some conference about Anonymous. And he said that the solution to Anonymous is to get them all girlfriends. <laughs> So, so I sent a tip, so I, I sent a crime tip to the FBI saying that I would send myself in if they, get, if they got me a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> but they haven't responded yet for some reason. <laughs> so in, in conclusion, I would say there's a, there's a few main lessons here. First of all, the majority of our victims use the same password everywhere, and that's why they were compromised. Like this is like the number one thing you can do to, to, to prevent yourself to prevent, to, to prevent your accounts from being hacked. I think Troy um, Hunt did some analysis based on the passwords that we leaked and found that up to 66% of people used, used the same password everywhere, which is a really easy way to make yourself vulnerable because if you, if you signed up to some crappy you know, SQL vulnerable website like Sony and use the same password for your banking details or for PayPal or for Twitter or your email, then that's going to be really easy to compromise you through a, through a really weak website, which is essentially the weakest link. The weakest, the weakest website you, you sign up for will allow you, hackers to get access to all your other accounts. So, so if there's one thing that anyone should be doing is not to use the same passwords everywhere. And the other thing was, which I already touched on is that um, information can really kind of break or make companies. The PR aspect is kind of is, is the thing that I think makes companies worry the most. Um, in 2015, Yahoo was hacked and one billion details were stolen from them. And the security team wanted to inform everyone, all the customers about this compromise, but the CEO vetoed it because she was scared that it was gonna be a massive PR issue and make them this competitive. And this was eventually revealed in 2017 or 2016 and it knocked a billion dollars off Yahoo's value when they were being sold to Verizon. So this is a really concrete impact that your company could have if you don't invest properly in cybersecurity. And I think unfortunately, even today, cyber companies, we hear so many hacks in the news, but the vast majority of hacks we probably never hear about because I don't really feel there's an incentive for companies to disclose when they've been hacked. In many cases, if you're a company holding sensitive customer information and that information got ha gets hacked, then it's the customer that loses out. You'll still be making money from, you're, you're, still, you're still gonna be making money from your customers. So there doesn't really seem to be an incentive for companies to actually uh, be transparent to their users about their security and when they've been compromised, which is a massive problem because customers can't really make an informed choice about which service or product to use if they don't know how secure it is. Um, I think one of the things that could help towards this is, is cyber insurance because under many cyber insurance policies, if you want to be compensated for, for a data breach, then you have to disclose to your customers that you've been compromised. In the UK, it's, it's a little bit better because we have the Data Protection Act and under the Data Protection Act, um, I think, well, not in the UK, but in some parts of Europe, there's, there's some regulations requiring companies to disclose when they've been compromised or when customer data has been lost. And I think that, sh that should be um, a regulation that's, that's everywhere, including in the UK. One good thing about UK law is that under the Data Protection Act, if a company loses data or they're found to be negligent in the way they process data, they can be fined up to half a million pounds, which is what Sony was fined, but it's still a drop, of, drop in the bucket for most of these organizations. 
Is there time for questions? Yeah. Okay. Super. Um, so, yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mustafa. Really interesting talk. Has anyone got a question that they might want to ask um, to Mustafa? What's the worst thing that's ever been done to you uh, personally? What, in retribution for some of the... Or just for in hacking. general? I don't think... Well, let me, let me think if I've ever been hacked. No, I don't, I've never been hacked. Like, I, <laughs> like, no, I'm seriously, I've never, I've never been hacked. But, I mean, it's not because... Like, I'm sure I could be hacked if someone tried. But the, the closest thing was actually I leaked information about myself in a database. Because when I was leaking some information, when I was, when I, in 2011, when I was leaking um, the database of hackforums.net, I was in that database. So, <laughs> so I had to leak my own information. Because if I, if I remove that information, then people will be suspicious as why there's one missing record in that database that has to be leaked. You know? <laughs> so yeah, that's the worst thing that's happened. But in, during, during our time, a lot of people would try to, just try to uncover our identity because we were anonymous at the time. So they would, they would try to find out our real names or our locations. And every single time was unsuccessful. But some people um, thought I was this other guy called Solomon Seller who lived in London and worked for some jobs company. And he was, I was kind of exposed, exposed as, this, as this person who wasn't me. So, but, and that had a massive impact on him because he, he kind of got really scared about that. And he actually fled to France with his student loan money to kind of, to kind of escape that, because he thought he would be arrested. OK, any others? Yes? Uh, on a uh, uh, kind of recent topic, I didn't know what any of the answers were back to my bad information in London. OK, so it was, um, has anyone out of, the, yeah. out of the group made any money out of what they, out of what they did? Um, well, I mean, overall, there was no financial hacking involved in terms of credit card details, or it, no credit card details were compromised or anything like that. But I do believe Hector, which, which you saw the picture of, um, sold one of the databases to someone before they were leaked for a couple of thousand dollars, which was the database for porn.com, which is a porn, porn website. That was sold for a few thousand dollars before it was leaked by, by Hector, which wasn't something that was we authorized, really. But we did, we did receive quite a lot of Bitcoin donations from people who liked what we were doing. We received 400, 400 Bitcoins in 2011, which was $18,000 at the time, which is now would be worth, we, we, we now would be worth $800,000. But most of those Bitcoins were spent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, super. Anyone else? Yes, please. Um, while you're speaking, you should have gone down. Really? Uh, I'm sure I, I wasn't me. Like, I was <laughs> like, why, would I, why would I do that? <laughs> All right, see. And uh, yes, just one more uh, at the back. So, so the word lulls is a corruption of the word LOL. And it was first coined in about 2003. It just basically means laughing at other people's expense. Cool. Um, and I've just got one. So um, hacking uh, is kind of seen as very cool, particularly for the sort of teenage um, youths of, of today. It, it is cool no matter what we try and do. What, what kind of message would you, would you give to teenagers and anyone kind of thinking about indulging in this kind of activity? Yeah, I mean, I guess this is the part where I'm supposed to be cheesy and say, don't do it, kids. But like... Um, oh, God, what have I done? <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I guess this is the part where I'm supposed to say, don't do it, kids. But if I'm being realistic... Kids will do it anyway. And this is like, there's so many young hackers in the UK that seem to get into some trouble. I don't know why, but UK seems to have a disproportionate amount of UK hackers being arrested. It's probably because it rains all the time here, so everyone has to spend the time indoors, and they end up, they just spend it hacking. So um, I, don't think the, I don't think the answer, I don't think we can just say, let's prevent kids from hacking. I don't think we're ever going to be able to, to, to prevent, to say kids don't do hacking, because kids will do what they're, told not to do. That's the whole appeal. That's, that's, the, that's the job of, of young people. The whole job of young people is to piss off adults. So, so that's their job, really. To, um, so, but I think, it's this, I think we have to kind of think about how we deal with that. And I think the National Crime Agency has a really sane policy in terms of how they deal with young hackers. Um, 
as opposed to the US, where they would just throw the book at you and arrest everyone, um, the NCA recognizes that actually, um, you, you know, th there's a more reasonable approach to take. So in tw in a few years ago, um, instead of simply arresting about 50 young people who were found to be using um, stretcher tools or these denial of service stack tools that let you DDoS websites, all they did was they um, visited, visited their parents' homes and told their parents that they were up to illegal activities. And that was enough to scare them to stop doing that. So thank you very much again, Mustafa. Really good stuff. Thank you. <laughs>